Okay, we are going to start it. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good night. Uh, I want to express my gratitude for showing this workshop, Quantum IoT Infrastructure Security for Service Space. It's an honor to moderate such a distinguished colleagues and friends. I am Karina Virarda from Argentina, a member of the Multiple Stakeholders Advisor Group at, of IJF, co-facilitator of the Best Practice Forum in Cybersecurity, I'm passionate about technology and all things related to digital, co uh, digital protection. Um, as we know, in recent years, we have been treat a significant increase in cybersecurity incidents at the international level, which alarming statistics is showing a consistent rise. Global interconnectivity depends on technology and the sophistication of criminal as crime as a service are the key factor behind the trend, so maybe we have more work. The lack of adoption of internationality recognized cybersecurity best practices is one of the fundamental challenges. Recognizing cybersecurity as a global issue is essential as the cyber attacks do not respect borders or jurisdictions. Organizations as the UN, the World Economic Forum, IGF Forum promote internationally recognized cybersecurity standards. <coughs> Sorry. Such as NIST Cybersecurity Framework and ISO 27001 Information Security Guidance, which provide a solid framework for protecting digital assets. Collaboration and international cooperation are equally essential, as the cyber attack often involve actors operating in multiple countries, sharing information about threats and cyber security tactics is vital to stay on a step ahead in the fight against these attacks. In summary, the increase in international cybersecurity incidents is a challenge that requires a global response. The adoption of the cybersecurity best practices and international collaboration are the fundamental pillars to addressing this growing threat and protecting our digital assets and an increasing interconnected world. In order to determine it with the best practice can be implemented, it is essential to understand the threats we are facing. So, we have two opening questions for the, all the panelists, which are as follows. Number one, what are the leading um, cybersecurity crisis threats throughout the IoT critical, oh, sorry, <laughs> threats across the IoT critical internet infrastructure, web, and quantum technology, and what are existing best practices to counter this threat? Number two, how can diverse stakeholders, including the ICF community, the Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity, Dynamic Coalitions, and the other relevant groups collaborate and contribute actively to development and implementation of these best practices? And number three, in the context of the continuity involving cybersecurity landscape, what key considerations are essential to ensure a safer and more trustworthy internet for our users and call the these areas. I kindly request that each of you introduce yourself. And you have 10 minute limit for your presentation. And the number one, please, uh, what the net is? Your turn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karina. Uh, my name is Walter Natris, and I am a consultant based in the Netherlands. And as such, I am the coordinator of the Dynamic Coalition at the IGF called Internet Standards Security and Safety Coalition. And this coalition has one primary goal that is to make the internet more secure and safer for all users. So whether public, private, or individuals. We do that through different working groups and these working groups focus on different topics on the topic of cybersecurity. So we have a topic called on Internet of Things, so security by design built into the Internet of Things, and I'm sure that Nicolas will tell more about that later. We 
re, uh, we published our first report yesterday morning here in Kyoto, which can be found online. We have a working group on procurement and supply chain management. And I think that is what I'm going to focus on most in a moment. That we have a one on education and skills to make sure that tertiary education deliver what industry needs in this field and not code programs from 20 years ago. We have one on, on data governance, we have one on consumer protection, we have a working group on emerging technologies and one on deployment of two specific standards, but then focusing on not the technical side, but I'm, I'm sure that also what we're discussing here is not about the technique, it's about political, economical, social and security choices that we have to make in a society. I think that what we try to aim to do, and I think that that answers one of the questions that I heard, is that when governments and larger industries start demanding security by design, when they procure their ICT services, devices, or products, that would mean that any company is not able to deliver these demands will not get big assignments. And that would be a major driver for getting everything, including IoT, more secure by design. What I think is important to understand is that the internet works as it does, and let's face it, it works fantastically because anybody in the world can at this moment follow us, they can ask questions to us, they can use the chat to interact with us, and that's all because of the way the internet functions and the way it is scalable. But unfortunately, when they built these rules, security was not an issue because people were, who were then connecting were working at either the US go government department of defense or they worked in some US universities and everybody knew each other. So there was no need for security. And then the world came online on the same principle and then showed that it was inherently unsecure. The technical community has made reparations. They made changes to the, the code that runs the internet. And that code running the internet is the public core of the internet that people talk about. So when you talk about protecting the public core of the internet, you're not just protecting undersea cables or land cables or server parks, you're also protecting the software that makes it work. And that is the weird thing about this story, that software that makes the internet and IoT more secure is not even recognized by any government in the world as such. So they, if you talk about standards, they talk about government bodies making standards or they talk about organizations like ISO making standards, but not about the internet standards. They are made by the technical community on a voluntary basis but that is what makes the internet run and not ISO because that is an administrative ticking box. So if we get governments to understand that it's the other standards they have to recognize formally as well, but also use them when they procure their services, their products, their devices, the world will change. But what is the current situation? The current situation is that there's not a living playing field for industry. When industry is not asked for a level of security built in, apparently they don't do it. And what if I was a single company and I decided I'm going to deploy all these standards? And that costs me money, it costs me time, it costs me effort, I have to train people. And if the competition does not do it, it means my product becomes more expensive and most likely governments won't buy it because they go for the cheapest option. So in other words, I would be out of business. So there's no living playing field. There's no demand from the big players. So there's no interest to deploy. So all the IoT devices coming to the market are usually insecure by design. And from that moment on are a threat factor for everybody in society. So if we don't put this pressure on industry to deploy, 
Nobody will, most likely, except a few that are more idealistic. And this is shown in the research that we've done on IoT security by design. And I will not take anything away from what Nicholas will be telling us, but we found that there's no pressure on to make IoT secure. There's no pressure from the outside. We've seen that also in the procurement study we've done. We've analyzed the documents around the world on procurement. And if security is mentioned, it is not always cybersecurity. And if it's cybersecurity, it's seldom on internet standards. There's one big exa example that does, that's the Dutch government. They mandatorily have to deploy 43 different standards when procuring or explain why they cannot do that. And that is reported to the Dutch parliament once a year. So why is this relevant? I think this is extremely relevant because we're discussing our future. IoT is already among us. AI is among us for far longer than most people realize. And who knows what is coming with a metaverse or quantum, and who knows what is invented tomorrow, because we're in a society that changes every two hours. And it looks like that time and time again, the same mistakes have been made. The product is invented, and it comes into the mar market usually untested for security. So is that something that should, we should be discussing, that when a new technology enters the market, that at least we test it formally in one way or another? Probably not legislate it, because you can't legislate what you don't know. But you can at least demand a certain amount of testing. So ICT in whatever form is allowed to the market from outside, usually it's also almost irreparable. So when they find the flaws, it, almost too difficult to repair them in some cases, so they remain a threat factor for sometimes decades. And with AI, perhaps with quantum or the metaverse and all else that is in store, we can demand at least security from the out outset. Demand it before we start procuring it, and certainly before we buy it. So large corporations and governments can set that example. And when they do, they become a standard and the security will become available for all of us. So if we make governments and larger industry aware of their role, their potential influence, and to provide them with the information they perhaps lack now, they will change the world for us. And that's our ICT goal, to make the internet more secure and safer by the widespread deployment of security-related internet standards and ICT best practices. And if you're interested to join, you can do that at is3coalition.org, and the three is the number three. Our reports are there, also the report Nicholas will be telling about, and uh, that, I think that is about what I would like to contribute for now. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, the second panelist is Carlos, uh, Carlos Martinez. He's online. Carlos, I can see you online. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, I, I have a, like four or five slides that I would like to share. I hope that I can share my screen. Yes. Okay. So I, I'll be right to the point. Um, well, my, my name is Carlos Martinez. I work for LACNIC, the in Regional Internet Registry for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, I've been working for LACNIC for the best part of the last 15 years. And um, I'm currently the head of technology or the CTO for LACNIC. One of the things that has um, initially caught my attention when I started working for LACNIC was the need for deploying two technologies that at the time were just um, not very well known, actually. These are DNSSEC and RPKI, and I'm sort of grouping them because I believe that uh, there's, a, there's a, a common theme between them, which is securing the infrastructure or securing the core of the internet. Um, good, uh, good uh, and 
uh, describe, uh, I would say, a, a, a bit of a dire uh, situation regarding the security on IoT. But um, that's one part of things. Uh, when you have devices, the devices may be secure themselves, but you still have to traverse the internet to get information from one point to another. So I will be, I will try to go through this very quickly. Uh, when I speak about internet infrastructure, I'm not thinking about uh, the physical layer in this case, not, not about fibers, cellular or satellites, but I'm thinking particularly about what I used to call the three pillars of a properly functioning internet. The internet to work, as we know it, it depends on three functions, basically. One is routing, the other is control and forwarding, basically the ability of the network to have one packet on ingress and deliver that packet to a destination, to the proper destination, and a complementary function, which is domain name resolution, or DNS. Okay, so the three things are necessary. There's a subtle difference between routing and forwarding. Uh, forwarding is the actual decision of a router when it has a packet and needs to analyze the packet and decide which interface it should be sent off. And routing, which is a control function where the router learns a table that it uses to decide how to forward packets. Uh, both things are necessary, of course, are complementary. So, um, this is a very high level threat overview of these two or three functions. And uh, each, you, you could probably identify more than this. Um, name resolution, for example, suffers from domain spoofing, uh, where a server pretends to host a DNS zone that it shouldn't, or it's not authorized to hold. And this is widely used, for example, for phishing attacks. Cache poisoning is another well, very well-known uh, threat to the DNS and where um, a specially crafted packet can poison in a, well, uh, in a way a server and uh, allow uh, an attacker to actually instruct a server to lie to his customers. Uh, this, this has been widely discussed in the industry and has in a way caused a bit of, I would say, loss of trust on the part of users, uh, something that we've been in, 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 different, in different industries and then in different ways. Routing suffers from something in a way similar, if you will. Uh, route hijacking is one, probably one of the most well-known um, uh, effects of, on attacks on the routing system where uh, an autonomous system publishes a network it shouldn't, or it doesn't have authorization to do so. Um, recently, we have witnessed uh, some, some instances of internet instability due, due to hijacks or to a related um, situation called route leaks, where, uh, where there is a uh, network within the internet that announces some prefixes, but it cannot fulfill the promise of actually carrying the traffic to the destination. It usually happens when a small network announces uh, the whole routing table of the internet, and it basically cannot transport all the traffic that uh, every other network starts sending through it. So, as it was mentioned previously, uh, security on some of these protocols was in a way, an afterthought. These protocols were created when the internet was a much, I would say, um, naive place. And uh, some security had to be, I would say, backported into them. Um, DNS, for DNS, we have the DNS security extensions, or DNSSEC, which introduce digital signatures within the DNS responses. And this allows uh, a resolver to actually verify a response. This is, of course, not, not supposed to be a complete explanation of DNSSEC. This is just the general idea. And RPKI does a similar thing for routing. 
Again, uh, there is some cryptography introduced into the BGP protocol and some um, additional decision points that are introduced in the, um, in the BGP algorithm that allows a router based on some signatures, which I'm going to call ROAS because that's the name they have, um, allows a router to make a decision on whether uh, route is a correct one or not. So again, this is RPK particularly has a lot of complexity uh, that I'm not describing and I'm, <laughs> I don't have the time to get into, but there's a lot of documentation in the internet. So a few considerations regarding, for example, the use of cryptography within these protocols. Some people have the misconception that every time you use cryptography is to ensure encryption or ensure um, secrecy in a way. Both RPKI and DNSSEC make heavy use of cryptography, but they not, they not encrypt messages. They use, they are not intended to provide privacy per se. Maybe privacy is a consequence of implementing these protocols, but they are not, cryptography in DNS and RPKI is not used for uh, providing secrecy. What is this used for? Cryptography here is used for authenticating and verificating signature chains that ensure either a correct DNS response or a correct BGP announcement. Um, there is a slight difference between them. A PKI requires a, a well-defined PKI or a public key infrastructure with you know, a trust anchor and CRLs, uh, all the complexity that comes with a PKI. The RIRs have taken the role of operating the uh, trust anchors of this, of this RPKI. On the other hand, the NSEC uses a simpler chain of trust because it, ha it can depend on some features that the DNS already has, like for example, the tree-like structure. Um, these technologies are basically useless unless the community, I would say, realizes that this, there is a shared responsibility here. In both RPKI and DNSSEC, there is a function, which is the signing, the signing either of the DNS or the routes, and the validation. And both are necessary. Uh, signing becomes useless if no one validates, and the other way around. If you're validating but you have nothing to compare these, uh, these signatures with, uh, again, it's useless. And th there's a shared responsibility here, and this is probably my if you remember one thing of what I've been saying, please remember that the message of shared responsibility in this case, it's something that we need to get across the industry. Um, regarding quantum, um, my, the, the, the previous panelists mentioned that uh, security was sort of an afterthought and that's completely true. And there's a, a silver lining to it, which is that this afterthought was implemented in the form of an overlay. The core protocol remains unchanged, and there is, I would say, a layer of cryptography applied over it. The cryptography here didn't exist before, it was added afterwards, and it was added in a way that can be replaced. There's a term that is technically used here, which is algorithm agility, and all these, um, both DNSSEC and RPKI uh, have algorithm agility built in. So eventually when a post-quantum cryptographic algorithm is designed or is standardized, it will be possibly applied to both DNSSEC and RPKI. Um, I don't have it in the slide, but I, I have another thing that I would like to mention which is that I have a strong position on initiatives that uh, point towards weakening of cryptographic algorithms. There have been some discussions in governments and other fora regarding the necessity of weakening uh, or providing backdoors to algorithms. And I, I, I think that would be a very poor decision to implement something like that. So that's all I have for now. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Carlos, uh, for your presentation. Very clear. I, I am thinking the same. I, I am support very strongly. And the third panelist is Maria Luque. She is online. And uh, Maria, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Good morning from Madrid. Actually, I'm very glad to be here with you today. It's 2 a.m. in the morning in Madrid. And today, um, since that we are going to speak about software, um, it's a key point of our discussion. So give me a second to find my presentation, see if I can share my screen. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, perfect. Yes, perfectly. Okay, I take it as a yes. So we were saying today, I, I was saying that we were speaking about software and software is a core of my presentation about quantum security. First of all, I am Maria Luque. And for the past 10 years, I have been advising um, national governments, local government agencies, uh, mostly in Spain and in the European Union on what to do with emerging technologies, uh, for example, neurotechnologies, space connectivity, or quantum technologies, and how to do it so that whatever we do with these technologies can benefit um, society in great ways. So uh, also been working with quantum organizations, quantum startups, and national quantum strategies for the past three years. And um, very glad to be here. So the focus of today. Today, for me, we, are, we have a challenge, OK? And the challenge is understanding how quantum technologies are going to disrupt not only cybersecurity, but our entire conception of how we process and how we store and how we communicate information. As you may have probably seen in the media, the protagonist is quantum computing. Now, its potential is immense to bring about new solutions to all challenges, computational or not. But once it is lived, it will somehow imply that our current cryptographic systems are unsafe and won't be able to safeguard our privacy. So let's try to understand today in 10 minutes how to look at the quantum threat and how to take advantage of quantum to actually be quantum safe. Now, we're in the IGF. <laughs> and the IGF's motto this year is an internet for everyone. An internet for everyone is possible through universal access and privacy. And the fact that our communications can be kept secret is the base of our integrity as individuals and as nations, of course. And to keep the confidentiality of our online interactions, we trust what we call cryptographic algorithms, what Carlos was speaking about. And this trust is built on something we call computational harness assumptions. The fact that they will be able to withstand a cyber attack no matter what but the truth is that a breakthrough in cryptanalysis can make the systems vulnerable in one night. Now, we all know of a company who suffered a cyber attack in the past three or four months. And as my mates were saying, when it's not a cyber attack on a company, uh, it's a cyber attack on a national health system or a security infrastructure. We do live in cyberspace. Um, thanks to 5G, among others, of course, uh, we rely each time more on cyber physical systems, such as IoT, uh, the critical internet infrastructure, and the web. And the more digital our infrastructure is, the more attack vectors we have to withstand. And each domain is vulnerable in its own very unique way. Um, for example, as Carlos was saying before, critical infrastructures depend on scale systems that are normally very outdated. <laughs> IoT environments have very limited 
computing resources by design and very limited security schemes by design, as my mate Bud Denadres was saying. And also when we're speaking about the internet and telecom networks, we are shifting softly towards software-defined networks, meaning that they will be more susceptible to cyber attacks. So we can say in a way that the cryptographic systems that protect our digital infrastructure are shaky ground today. We can really say that they are a weak point to watch. And during the past decades, we've discovered quantum algorithms. And quantum algorithms with a crypto analytical potential that can break the cryptographic techniques that we use today to protect our data. We just need quantum processors that are big enough to run them. Quantum processors, meaning quantum computers. A new type of computing device, you heard about it, that is capable of performing very specific calculations, some of which are actually intractable by uh, current classical computers. And quantum computer uh, is truly really a game changer. It uses the principles of superposition and entanglement, whatever they mean, um, to change the way we store and process information. And while large scale quantum computers are not a reality, they're not available yet, of course, the fact is that creating a strong computer, quantum computer, can accelerate our process of solving the schemes we use in public key cryptographic algorithms to protect our data. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, thanks to a quantum algorithm uh, like SHORE, we could sort RSA encryption. And this can break and destabilize us. Um, and it's not about data breaches, and it's not about, not only about financial loss, it's about losing the integrity of digital documents, all of them, losing the sanctity of our personal data, and losing control over the health and the financial systems that keep us together. And the truth is that we don't have to wait for quantum computing to come because by harvesting now the crypto later, which I think you, I assume you've heard a million times by now, uh, someone can store encrypted information to decrypt it once quantum technology becomes more advanced. And this means that the impact of quantum computing truly started yesterday, as we can say. Now the paradox is that quantum can also give us the key back to our integrity. And in fact, quantum technologies and some classical techniques are the vet of the tech industry and governments when it comes to cybersecurity in the future to come. Um, now today, as you can say in the presentation, we're going to focus, we don't have time, we're going to focus on the tools we are developing today to be quantum safe in the short term and in the mid term. The first one is post-quantum cryptography. Carlos was talking about it before. And the second one is quantum key distribution. Now, let's focus on the solution that we have more at hand. We were saying that encrypted communication that is intercepted today can be decrypted in the future by a quantum computer that is strong enough. Now, post-quantum cryptography, what it, what it offers to us is new classical algorithms that we believe to be secure against a quantum threat. There's nothing quantum in these algorithms, but we have seen computational hardness that can withstand the brute force of a quantum computer that tries to decipher it. Um, PQC is software. PQC is a short-term solution. Um, we're making an effort to standardize them, uh, guided by the NIST from the US. And also, you probably heard of them. There's Skyver for secure key exchange, and there is Lithium, Sphinx, uh, Falcon for digital signatures. And the interesting thing here, talking about best practices, is that the tech industry can enforce these algorithms into the solutions they offer to us today, even though they haven't been standardized. And in fact, they do this. <laughs> which is interesting, for example, for government agencies that use 
technologies in the cloud or store sensitive data on the cloud. Here we can see a couple of examples of uh, major tech companies taking a hybrid approach uh, via the cloud. For example, AWS has a cloud commercial environment, but it allows you to apply this algorithm Kyber within your security shell, and that's nice. Google has started combining classical um, cryptography algorithms with potential quantum resistant algorithms for the FIDO2 standard, which is the standard that you use to authenticate yourself when you uh, initiate your session on a website. And Cloudflare, for example, has done something that's more or less the same, right? So PQC, what I want you to, to get from this is that it requires new software stacks. It can be started, it can be implemented starting now. And due to the comparatively low cost doing that, the private sector can take the lead, guided by standards, but it can take the lead. Now, we get to QKV, which is the crown jewel to me, is my favorite. QKV, quantum key distribution, um, can be the mid-term solution to the quantum threat to cybersecurity. It is hardware-based, it is not software-based. Now, QKD uses the principles of quantum mechanics to establish a shared secret random key between two parties that have a secure communication channel and alerts you of any eavesdropping attempts. Now, for QKD, what I want you to imagine, because we, we love to talk about the quantum internet, but we're not close to that. What I'd like you to imagine for QKD is an entire infrastructure like those of the ISPs of the internet, i.e. one, two, three, for telecom networks, but using quantum information processing techniques. That is a quantum network. And if we are successful in implementing quantum networks, we're going to have unhackable networks for secure communications. Now I'm optimistic about the future of QKD, uh, but it's definitely not a civil ballot, and there are many challenges uh, to solve before it's deployed at scale. It's a bumpy road uh, for starters, and it is very costly. Okay, QKD is a moonshot because we need to have entirely new infrastructures for secure communication. There is still distant limitations. For example, if you have a quantum network that is hyper big, you will probably, I mean, your quantum states of the photons can be degraded and the information maybe cannot make it. So we have to work on that. Um, also, these quantum networks, they have to be integrated in classical telecom networks because that's the interesting thing that we can, that we can go about. And uh, it requires compatibility. It requires us to work on interoperability. And this is such a technical challenge. And also scalability and, uh, and the potential to, for the service to work 99% of the time. Why? because quantum networks are going to be designed for the first use case to be secure government communications. It's going to be defense and it's going to be intelligence and they need to work. But the thing is, despite the limitations, I want you to understand that quantum networking is starting to work. Um, we can see that in Madrid, in the Madrid quantum communications infrastructure because it is able to send info over radius of 40 uh, square kilometers. Uh, we, can, we can also see that in New York with Connect and the NYU, because they have a quantum network that actually works. And also in China, you already see in the news, they're very good at doing ground segment to space segment communication um, with quantum teleportation. So with QKD, we have PQC for the short term. With QKV, the investment needs to be very big and very continued. And not only nations and federations can kickstart design and deployment of these uh, of these technologies. For example, the European Commission has the Euro QCI program, and the stronger use case, as I was telling you, is secure government communications. Now, I have one minute for this. Um, what I want you to get from this presentation is that, of course, there is a threat that may come with quantum computer in 10 to 15 to 20 to 25 years. 
but there are things and techniques that we can implement, standardize and use together in a phase approach in these 20 years till quantum computing comes. The first one to me is going to be PQC because it's classical and we can do it now. The second is going to be quantum networking and the end game is going to be full deployment of quantum communication uh, infrastructure networks and also quantum computer, the quantum internet, sensors, computers, everything connected, protecting your data. So taking this into mind, how can we participate um, in making this happen? We can do many things, right? But first of all, for me, is always thinking about yourselves. And thinking about yourselves means that if you have an organization, you need to think about um, how it can be quantum safe. And the way you can do this is understanding what you have in terms of information architecture, not that we are used to mix on premise and cloud services to host and communicate your data, understand which info security is kind you're following, your level of encryption, as Carlos was saying, is it robust, is it not? Uh, have an inventory of your cryptographic algorithms and also see how much you can invest in your transition to quantum security. If you're a small organization, you may get to PQC and that's all for the next 10 years. If you are a stronger, bigger organization, maybe you can also uh, try to understand how to engage in quantum communication networks. Um, the industry is already busy working in on inter interoperability and compatibility together with governments for PQC and also for quantum networking. The governments are already launching national strategies and engaging quantum solutions into their cybersecurity strategies. For example, the European Union is working on this right now. They're sandboxing PQC and QKD to have software stacks, to have hardware that actually works. And for the IEF community, and, and I'm counting me in the IEF community, I would tell you that quantum is still a mystery to most of us in the policy community. So what, what I think we need is to engage, we, we need to learn, we need to study this, we need to understand this, uh, we need to create spaces uh, for discussion and engagement. Um, I think it's on us to introduce something else beyond policy thoughts on how to collaborate and standardize, uh, standardize these technologies. And also, um, let me finish with this, I think that quantum technologies bring both light and darkness to our lives because our lives are digital and that our privacy is our health, uh, is our identity uh, and the digital rights of the people cannot be lost in translation in a global race towards being quantum safe and unhackable that no one understands. So I hope uh, we can work together on this and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Maria, for your presentation. And we thank you for sharing your ideas, and we invite you to ask questions to have an interactive session. And Olga is our next panelist. The microphone is yours. Thank you both. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. This is extremely interesting. Um, and uh, I have a question for the experts once uh, we have the questions and answers as a part of the session. Thank you for inviting me. I would like to bring to you a different perspective now, uh, first from the capacity building uh, concept and then from the public policy concept. First, uh, let me tell you my name is I am Olga Cavalli. I am a university teacher at University of Buenos Aires. I teach um, internet infrastructure and telecommunications infrastructure, which is where I have worked most of my first stage of my career. Then for 20 years, I've been working in public policy in Ministry of Foreign Affairs and now in the Secretary of Innovation in Argentina. Presently, I am the National Director of Cybersecurity. So I want to bring you some, some, some ideas from, from these two perspectives. The school was created uh, 15 years ago because we realized that the participation of Latin America and all these uh, dialogue spaces where the policy related with the internet are defined. 
was very scarce, was few, and was perhaps not so much relevant to prepare to participate in, in dialogues and, and comments and, and shaping the, the policies that are totally different from perspective from Latin America to other regions. Latin America is, is, has a different challenge from other regions. It's extremely unequal in relation with uh, economic distribution, infrastructure distribution, so our problems are not the same like other regions. So this is why we created the space to train professionals at any age. Uh, uh, any, uh, any background is welcome, whether technical, uh, policy makers, uh, journalists, uh, lawyers, uh, in order to learn uh, all the rules that make the internet work and how to how to participate and understand the, pol the problems and challenges that Latin America has. So we have been doing that for 15 years. And for the first time this year, we went out from big cities. We rotate among the, the Americas. And uh, we had one totally focused on cybersecurity in the, in, in the venue of the Organization of American States. That was very interesting. And this year, for the first time, we went away from big cities and we went to a city inside uh, one state in Brazil, city of Campina Grande, with 400 fellows. So um, you can find information in our website, governanceinternet.org. Uh, what I would like also to, to talk about is the, the extremely fast pace of the adoption of ICT technologies in, uh, by, by, by human beings. Um, there are different estimations, maybe Nico and Wout more, know more details about that. But I had a, a report from Ericsson that next year we will have 22,000 million of IoT devices. And then I found another one from Cisco saying that the number will be 50,000. So the difference is interesting, but I think that the, um, the, um, the amount of, of devices is enormous compared with what we have, what we have been dealing up to now. This is um, a number of reasonable number of devices per person. Considering that the population of the world is 88,000 million people, the, the pace of adoption of all these digital infrastructures, especially the new ones, is uh, very, very fast. It's faster than, much, much faster, five, 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 five times, sorry, it's the time, it's, it's the jet lag. Um, faster than electricity and telephony, much, much faster. So, also, <clears throat> it was already mentioned by, by Wout and, and colleagues, the, it, it, most of these technologies were not designed with concept of security from scratch. They were designed in a different environment, in a different time, uh, with different ideas. So, thus, it's extremely challenging. And... Um, um, I would like to consider now uh, some public policy that we have been implementing in Argentina. Although I am participating here as an academic, I uh, have a, a public policy role, so I want to, to tell you what we have been doing in Argentina. Um, our role in the national government, we have a, um, we have a target, which is the national um, administration. So for that, there is a resolution that establishes minimum requirements of cybersecurity uh, of, uh, for, for them. What they have to do? They have to prepare a security plan. They have to share it with us. We have a database with all the security plans. And the most important thing is that they must design, uh, assign a one focal point. That focal point is in contact with us in a permanent basis. We provide training for them every, every month and sometimes more frequently with news about technology and, and also we share with them all the vulnerabilities that the national cert that depend on our administration also uh, can detect. We, we share with them all this information on a daily basis. If they have an incident, they, they have to uh, share that with us and, and the, the national cert and our experts can help them, and uh, this communication and this establishment of the, the security plans and, and the communication is mandatory for them. So there is, there is a binding resolution. It's not that voluntary or aspirational, but it's mandatory for them. Also, um, we have developed um, a manual on what to do if they have an incident. 
So the, it describes the different uh, stages that they have to go through if they if they have an incident. And um, with, I think that that would fit into the question about best practices and also the, the, the public policy that I mentioned to you. Uh, also, we have uh, published the, the new or approved the new uh, cybersecurity strategy for Argentina. This is the second one that was produced after a public comment period uh, during the month of um, January this year. And um, uh, let me check if I'm forgetting something. Um, th that would be uh, all that I want to share with you. I have a question for, for Maria, for Wout, and for, for Nico. Uh, what I see now, it's, um, it's an increasing gap and challenging for developing countries, especially for small and medium enterprises, in catching up with all these new changes in technology. And I see this gap really being very, very big not only because of understanding technology, but also about buying it. It's extremely expensive, and some countries, we have some restrictions for import, import some products and some hardware, and also the lack of human resources that we all know that it's a, it's a big challenge for all countries, not only for developing countries, but also for developed ones. But some human resources go away, like my son is living in Europe because he was captured by by a company that thought that he was very well prepared. So he was trained in Argentina by, in a public university and now he's working in another country, uh, which is good for him, but maybe not, for, not good for, for developing economies. Just an example of the challenge that we are facing. So, uh, and, and looking at all these quantum technologies that are being developed, how, how do you see the, the small and medium enterprises or developing countries catching up with this with this changing, fast changing uh, technologies that will be used and will be implemented very quickly. Thank you. So I did two things. I spoke and then the question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Olga. Sorry. Uh, we have uh, only seven minutes for questions. If you want to answer the questions, is okay? Yes, Olga? Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, let me see. Uh, Mohamed, do you have any question in the chat? Uh, no, no, we don't have any questions yet. Yes, maybe I could accumulate one question and, and we could, uh, the panelists could respond as well. Uh, because you, you all talked about different technologies and it's known that, that the IoT number of devices is increasing, and in the case of the quantum computing, it's already been developed, and also ICT is not showing, uh, deploying the, the best practices for security in every service, and as Olga said, it's, it's so, so expensive to, to, to have all, all of this. So, uh, uh, yes, so my question is, do you think that uh, also in the case of, of RPKI and DNSSEC, do you think that the law enforcing these technologies is a good way to go? Uh, what are the, the, the threats or the, or the risks, maybe commercial risks in, in, in having this? Why, why we are not uh, having this uh, as a mandatory thing? Uh, in the case of, of DNSSEC and RPKI for the networks, in the case of the IoT security standards uh, made by the IETF, sometimes that for these constraint devices, there are solutions already uh, in, in, in standardizing uh, entities. And also for ICT, right? Why, why this is not like quantum resistant algorithms that we are seeing in, in, in the core internet? Why these technologies are not applied for all the ICTs by, by a mandate, by, by a law enforced thing? Uh, maybe if you want to have two minutes uh, per panelist to trying to, to respond and also accumulate <laughs> on the other questions we, we have had from, from Olga uh, and, and the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Maybe starting with, with Carlos, then, uh, yes, go ahead, Carlos. Sure, there's, the, those were a bunch of questions in a single one. I, I, I will try to, to make a, a couple of points. I. I personally don't believe that mandating technology is a good idea. And I've, I've seen many examples where that has failed. 
That said, I think the situation for DNSSEC and RPK AI is vastly different than the situation from IoT. IoT has a, a, a serious issue with cost, with cost per device. There's a race to the bottom in cost per device because since you have so many million devices, it makes sense to have the cheapest device uh, that, that you can actually manufacture. And there's a race to the bottom that this certainly doesn't uh, help in developing new technologies. DNSSEC and RPKI, I think it's a bit, uh, there's a difference there. I think one of the issues that the internet has faced over the year in deploying many new technologies, it happens for IPv6 as well, is that the, the thing that many effects in the internet are ex externalities. That those are things that you, as part of the internet, have to do at your, own, at your own cost on behalf of another party, to benefit another party. At, and sometimes that is, you know, commercially a hard sell. So I think that's what has been one of the barriers in deploying new technologies on the internet. And this, I think there's the two different um, phenomena there that need to be addressed differently. And regarding the, the you mentioned about why you are not seeing post-quantum algorithms be applied, in my opinion, I mean, the post-quantum algorithms that have been proposed so far are less than satisfactory. I basically, variations of elliptic curve algorithms with very, very long keys that are simply not practical. I mean, they exist, but they are not practical. They, they would create these huge signatures that are a threat in themselves. So, sorry, I, I think I took more than two minutes. Sorry about that. So now going to Maria, two minutes, please, and then Olga. Okay, okay. So uh, thank you very much, Olga, for your question. I think it's very interesting, and I would like to expand on this with you for an hour and a half. Um, regarding what you say about uh, PMS, basically, like small companies uh, faced with the challenge of, of trying to keep up with these quantum technologies and all of the buzz that comes with it, and also with something very interesting, because in Spain, for example, we have the National Security Scheme, which was updated uh, on October 2022, uh, last year. And it doesn't speak about quantum yet, but the standards that it uh, enforced uh, for information security are very high. It talks about, for example, multi-level security schemes, and it talks about buff for hardware, etc. And I can see this strategy, for example, in Spain being updated with PQC requirements and best practices. And the thing here, although I don't like it, and I don't think it's positive, the thing here is that a small company, uh, given that normally a small company, if it's a tech company or a normal company, um, they rely on the infrastructure of big tech companies and that uh, infrastructure providers to serve themselves. They don't, they don't, have, um, they don't have proprietary uh, uh, technology architecture schemes. So they rely on AWS, Microsoft Azure, they rely on uh, Google. And these companies are going to be able to offer this solution that Carlos and I don't like very much, which is PQC, PQC algorithms inserted in the cloud as an option for you to, to try to make your data safer in the place that it is. So this is going to be the option in the in the next five to 10 years for small companies, although I don't like it, but I can see it as a way. And also Olga, um, regarding national quantum strategies for developing countries and for any country in general, I can tell you that the tendency is, is, uh, is to be very, try to be very specialized and try to prioritize the one thing that you think you can invest in. For example, you can see that in the European Union, uh, everybody's very ambitious in the European Union, every country. But what we see is, for example, Spain says, hey, uh, we have, uh, we're very good at optics. We're very good at, uh, we have very good mathematicians. So we're going to go for developing quantum algorithms. Or, uh, and we're not going to invest so much on quantum computing because maybe we don't have the resources, right? So different countries are trying to understand which role they can play 
in the quantum supply internationally. And it can be betting on talent workforce, uh, it can be betting on developing algorithms, or it can be betting on theoretical physicists. Uh, it, it really depends and it's a challenge for every country. And I would love to, to expand on it more with you. Thank you, Maria. I take your word of expanding this in <laughs> among us. I may, I may get in touch with you. So I, I, it's interesting what you said first about that the, the most important companies in the world will develop some, some, some technologies that others will start work, uh, using, which is true and which is happening now, perhaps with cloud computing and other technologies. My fear is that developing economies and small and medium enterprises will be just consumers of technologies developed um, elsewhere, mainly in the States and China, which are the main uh, poles where all these technologies are being developed now. But that's uh, something that we can change with capacity building and awareness. And I, I'm always positive about technology, so um, I think that we have to go in that way. And thank you, thank you for for inviting me and for comments and, and Maria, Carlos, and all that left. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So we are ending the session here. The good, good insights about the law, uh, law enforcement maybe is not the solution. The capacity building and awareness are on there. And we need to be in the loop, in the loop of what is happening regarding requirements on the national agencies and uh, all this entire world of different technologies are approaching. So thank you so much to all the panelists and see you uh, next year in hopefully with, with new, new news about the, these technologies. Thank you so much. Big applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.